My name is David Dean. I've been living in uh, Almeria province for 28 years. And uh, I moved there after living in Austria. And I moved down to Spain. And I found the village virtually abandoned. Uh, there were about two families living there. Now, 28 years later, we have, we could call it quite a flourishing eco-village. We have no main services. We have no main water. We have no main electricity. We take our water from the river and uh, our electricity we get from solar panels and we use a, a hydraulic ram pump to pump up the water from the river around the houses. We have about 15 families from 15 houses now occupied in El Rio de Aguas. Um, I'm an international activist. I've been working in Ecuador since uh, 2012 um, and so my experience in Ecuador uh, led me to understand very quickly what was happening to my village, uh, which really is the plundering of the water by uh, corporations. Anyway, I'm going to introduce myself. I've got quite a few uh, pictures and drone shots, since this shows really quite quite clearly what's going on. Now, let's see if I can work this. Let me move along here. Okay, the, I've quite a few words here. This may also help for the, for the translators. Um, the village itself is in a, a, a Paraki Natural. It's a Nature 2000 European uh, protected zone. And actually around our protected zone of Karsten Yeso, as it's known, we have a secondary protected, protected zone. Um, the the um, Corridors of biodiversity, this is the, the way that the species move up and down the river. Well, the corridors of bi biodiversity are, are, are by the river. The, the river is essential, water is essential. Uh, I'm going to go in here. Can we, can we just move this so that little video shows here, Natty? I'm not quite sure how I do. I do it from here or you from there? We've got some drone shots here, which are quite. This is the little village itself, you see. This is the main street. Um, here we are in the water, turtles, beautiful. It's, uh, without the water, of course, the turtles can't, they, they die. Here's, uh, here's the oasis, you can see there a limestone cliff, and that's the kind of oasis we're living in. This is my house, and we're just going to zoom in to see me sitting on the window, still taking a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and then we move into my house, into the, the room itself, and you can see, well, this is who I am, this is where I'm working, this is where I live. And I'm very privileged to live in such a beautiful area. And then I can work with some of these really very difficult things which we have to work with. Okay, next slide. Um, requests, yes. Um, we've been to the, uh, the European Parliament, we've put a denuncio to the European Parliament. We've had a question asked in the, in the European Parliament around the abuses which are occurring to our area. Um, the answers came back in all three cases, yes, you're right. This is, um, these are abuses. These are, this is non-compliance with the directives of the European Parliament for the protection of Nature 2000 sites. Okay, good. Second thing, we got to the Human Rights Department. And, uh, applied to John Knox, the uh, Special Rapporteur for the Right to a Secure and Safe Environment, and once again he said, well, yes, I will look at this under the light of my mandate of March 2015. And today, uh, no response. After all, the man is also working with Lebanon and Syria and all the other cases. So we find that, you know, in that, that sense, we're not moving very far. We'll move on to the next. So here we are in Spain. That's where I live, in that bottom right-hand corner down there. Now, what is the problem? Well, we can see here the, the, the condition of the water through the aquifers of Almeria province. That's why we can broaden this to the whole province. Estado quantitivo, well, that means how much water is there. Malestado means bad condition. Estado químico, malestado, bad condition. Okay, so, that's a pretty impressive amount of red on that. Our aquifer is 060008 Aguas. We can see also in all those that we're looking at the horizontal 2015 to 2021. 
that th there's nothing in place to sort out this problem of bad quantity, over-exploitation, and invasion of nitrates into the water. So we go on, there we've got the map actually showing the surface area, all those red zones. It's the right-hand side of the map there, that's the Amrio side. Those red zones, they show the situation of over-exploited water supplies. Inherent rights of Mother Earth, well, the right to water is a source of life and the right to be free from contamination, pollution, toxic or radioactive waste. Now we move into a kind of a, an area just to explain. Sorbas, uh, del Campo, Tabernas, and down there at the bottom you see Los Meninos del Rio de Aguas, that's the spring which feeds our water. In the not overexploited condition, the water comes down, and we can see there with the arrows how it flows down to the spring of El Rio de Aguas. Now, what's been happening over the years, in actual fact since 1998, but in the more recent years we've had more exploitation, we see the flow of the water changes. It comes down to where you see these boreholes. So in Los Molinos del Rio Agua Spring, we have less and less water. We're going to the next one. We see, okay, as these boreholes go down, they're connecting into natural radiation, okay? This is from the uh, University of Almeria. The connection between the upper and bottom aquifers will be extremely dangerous for both quality and quantity. So I'm, I'm doing some research, of course, as you can see. In 2010, it was found radon and uranium was found in the drinking water of three municipalities. Now, just two weeks ago, I was reading in the, in the newspaper, which really alerted me to what was going on, that those same three municipalities now um, have purification plants, they're some of the most advanced in Europe, uh, to remove this natural occurring radiation. And also, which is fairly much under the table in Almeria, there are 13 other plants removing radiation from the water. Now, if we extrapolate that a little bit, uh, I expect all of you know how much food and vegetable produce come up from Almeria. We're exploiting our aquifers to the extent that we're encountering um, natural radiation in the water, which is now being used to, um, to water olive plantations and the plastic houses. It's not actually dangerous uh, in the sense that radon has a half-life of three days. The radioactivity of radon isn't actually taken up in the plant, so it's such a minor amount that I don't want to be standing here causing panic about the food products of Almeria. But in this tribunal, I want to put the case that what happens when we take all the higher water is that we run into lower water and it is, it is contaminated. So what's causing the problem? Basically, it's, um, it's olive trees. We have six million olive trees planted at 1,800 trees per hectare. That is pretty outrageous. Um, I'll put up here just to show you what what our climate is. Now, we live in the only semi-arid zone in Western Europe. Um, that's marked by the circle there. Where I'm living is an oasis. It's the last oasis in Western Europe. I'm going to move on fairly rapidly because we're a little bit short of time, perhaps. Um, I bring in here the context of protection because it's important to know that we are protected under the full European Union protections of the network of Nature 2000. And we are fully protected, okay, under that network. It's not working. <laughs> the threat, well, here we have the most overexploited uh, body of water, the body of water um, on which I'm living and on which uh, our village is reliant on. That is the body of water Aguas 060008. I mentioned here, okay, it's a, it's a 30 year over exploitation. The, the administration have known about this for 30 years. I've been reading memoranda which date from 1998, uh, 2000, 2010, 2015. It's amazing. It's all there. And also the point is that we've got 35,000 citizens. Now this presentation, I'm not just representing the citizens, you know, I'm representing um, the life of the flora, the fauna, the biodiversity, everything. And when we talk about nature, you know, we humans are a part of that. 
We tend to think of ourselves as being somehow senior to nature or some concept like that, but no, of course we're not. We are part of that biodiversity. So what I'm talking here, I'm talking on behalf of, of life. Um, I just put a little bit, another section in here, just showing again that 060008 written there in the red. Now, we see the subsystem is overexploited by 422%. I mean, that really is outrageous. There's no way of getting past that. And here we have the actual figures of 2015. It's a kind of a, a chart where the, the, the most overexploited at the top and the least at the bottom, they run from 422% down to 160%. This is not good. Um, before the overexploitation, before this started, before the mid-1990s, literally, this was a land flowing with milk and honey. Literally milk and literally honey. The um, villages were created because there was water. Um, farmers with, with subsistence farming, villages with uh, Irrigated lands, they're irrigated lands we can grow. In that climate, we can grow almost anything. Um, the more exclusive things, perhaps Nispero, with like oranges and lemons and fruits and fruits and fruits and trees, uh, bees, goats going out on the mountains and eating the, the, the beautiful herbs and so on and producing fresh, clean milk. And the meat is excellent, and the farmers and the Beekeepers have their bees and their honey, and the people would go to the market on, on, on Thursdays, it was always Thursdays, to the local town and exchange their produce with for money or different produce and so on. But over the years, we see overexploitation at the source of the river here. Let's have a look, see. Could, oh, yeah, okay, I got it, yeah. So you see the water on the left one, and you see no water on the right one. Uh, I took this picture on the right-hand side um, actually just a few days ago. It, it's dried up. Now, the, the, the spring of the river was up beyond those two tunnels, which incidentally were, were mined by the Romans. Uh, and the spring used to be about 200 to 300 meters higher up. Right now, you can see in October 2017, we're down to that. Now, previously, the water came out, uh, outside of those tunnels and fed the river. Right now, when we go inside that tunnel, we go up another 35 meters, there is the spring. Thank the Lord for the Romans 2,000 years ago. And the water goes through that tunnel now and then feeds the village and irrigates our irrigatable crop. So we are absolutely blessed. Um, that's uh, one of my dogs looking at the reduced level of water. <laughs> it's like, well, it really does speak for itself. You can see the lines. Um, it's staggering. I don't know what else to say. Um, biodiversity hotspot. This is a biodiversity hotspot. It is unique in Europe. Uh, Ian will, will talk about the flora and fauna. He is absolutely the expert on that, so I'll leave that to him. Yeah. Here I show you a picture of like what it looks like just outside the valley. Okay? Uh, we are uh, in the experience of a, of a changed climate. I, I've I'm not using the word climate change because we're past climate change. We are now in a changed climate. Uh, I want to be accurate with the words we use around the fact that the climate has changed. Uh, we no longer get regular rainfall. Uh, so far this year, we've had 181 liters per square meter. That is not very much. A desert climate uh, starts to be a desert climate under 200 liters. Okay, so. Actually, that was taken last year. This year it's a little bit more green because we had, at the end of August, we had a very lucky 64 litres per square metre, and we had a kind of, um, how we say, a spring in autumn. But that, that gives you a very good idea of the countryside we're talking about where we grow six million olive trees. Completely insane. Now this is the oasis where I live. This is what's under threat. And the, the, the contrast is staggering. We are the last oasis in Western Europe. Um, Spanish national television uh, made a documentary on, on, on our situation, as has Arte, which is German-French television, and as have Swiss public television. Uh, it's a scandal. 
And I say to the people down in, down in Almeria, we are now an international scandal. Uh, we had a demonstration in Almeria City like two nights ago, and, the, and what we're doing here is reflecting directly down into Almeria and reflecting into the, into the news and media down there. So I thank you all very much for that. We go on villages and water. I've talked about the, the connection that villages, of course, were created thousands of years ago because there was water. Uh, can we start the video here? This is a nice little video of what is happening today. This is the village of Sorbas, the town of Sorbas. And water is delivered by truck twice a week because there's no drinking water. And this is happening all around Almeria. We don't have fresh drinking water from the ground anymore. It's being exploited. So, I, I don't know, this is not really what we expect to see in Europe. I don't think so. And uh, here's this lady coming out here. And we ask her um, what's going on. And she says, well, the town water, it makes me feel safe. So this is a... Can I go on to that? Dying villages. Irrigation systems dry. And we have these villages of, of Gotcha, like uh, Moras, Maidomo, 14, 6 years, 4 years. And there was just another quick little video here of what's happening in Gotcha. So this is a village, the first one that's dried out. There used to be 100 people living in this village. What are they talking about 25, 30 years ago? Now we have 14. Here's uh, Manuel. He's one of, the, one of the 14 living there. You can see how dry his land is. This was beautiful land. It was full of orange trees. When I first arrived in Almeria, this was a beautiful village with a considerable amount of vegetables and, and, and irrigated land. You see that vine? It's dead. We're going to go, uh, and you see this, it's dead. There is no water. It, it's, and uh, as you look into the bottom right hand corner here, we're going to very shortly see, on the bottom right hand corner, that used to be full of water. That was the deposit of water. That irrigated all that land. Now it's absolutely dry. This is what I call evidence, but it is evidence. So we look and see, well, how long have people lived there? Well, since Neolithic times, how many hundred thousand years ago is that? And you can also see, interestingly, what sort of protection does the government put around what might actually be a heritage site a Neolithic, with Neolithic paintings? A little bit of branding, but that's not very big paintings. But on the other hand, we do have Neolithic cave paintings there, so we can, water has been there forever until now. Um, consequences. Well, of course, any threats to the river, they threaten all of us. As I was mentioning earlier, we are all part of the same system. If we humans start removing the water from our, from our lives, we're not only killing um, the, the biosphere, we're killing ourselves, of course. And when we, if corporations start to look at that from the, from the large point of view, that, hey guys, you know, it's not all about money, it's about life, it would seem to be a good idea. Uh, give us a give us a, 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 a go here. We're we're seeing uh, these are these are wonderful. These are the, these are the turtles which live in the river, and they are of course threatened. Um, and they're just moving up the rock there. They're going to, they're moving up to do a little bit of sunbathing. <laughs> Ian has some more some more pictures like so. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay, that's very beautiful. Mary Margill from America, she drew us up a draft, a draft ordinance for Sorbas. This is completely in line with what, with what we're doing here, what we're talking about. Rights of natural communities and ecosystems. On that last little video you see a natural community and ecosystem. Natural communities and ecosystems within Sorbas, including but not limited to rivers, streams and aquifers. aquifers possess the right to exist, flourish, regenerate, and naturally involve. Well, of course they do, but they don't, do they? Right to water. All residents, natural communities, and ecosystems in Sorbus possess a fundamental and inalienable right to sustainable access, use, consumption, and preservation of water drawn from natural water cycles that provide water necessary to sustain life. The right to water includes, but is not limited to, the right to be free from corporate water withdrawals. I've 
talked about this draft. Um, it's time for us to present it. This tribunal will assist us in to empower us to present this to municipalities who are receiving money from six million olive trees. <laughs> you see the problem? It's called corruption. Olive plantations, this is a beauty. We're going to see how what six million olive trees look like. For a start, these are super intensive. You can see the irrigation lines. They run through the six million trees here. You see how the soil is totally degraded. It's been bulldozed. It's been flattened. Um, the land's been put on a 21 degree tilt so we can use harvesting equipment previously used for grapes. So that now look, that those, these are the olive plantations. There is the water. I mean, it's our, it's clearly it's outrageous. And talk about monoculture. I mean, this is a total monoculture. There's no life. There's no natural life there. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? I, I, I say that myself, it really is. And it's a complete disaster. It's destruction. It's devastation. One man with harvesting equipment could harvest uh, 30 tons. When I was first down there in, in Almeria, we used to have people moving, working from my village. <coughs> 120 people would be employed. There's no employment for the people, and we're going into a completely desert condition. So 2014, 2015, 2016, we have an average consumption per tree of 10 meters per tree. So that when we have 6 million trees, which we have now approximately, we have 60,000 tons a day, and we're in the semi-arid zone, and we have an aquifer which is 422% overexploited. That's kind of very factual. <laughs> okay. I've only got one minute. Okay. Um, in here it writes some other, okay, the right to regenerate. That is displaced. The industrial olives are very definitely a monoculture. Uh, genetic structure, these olive trees are genetically modified. Um, not only genetically modified, they only have a lifetime of about 10 years. They're removed, they're chopped out, and then they're replanted again for the next harvest. After, after three years, they come back into full production. This is not uh, good for the nature. Human cost, we can see it's a disaster. These are the villages here, Los Canales, Los Perales, and so on. Uh, just a quick clip here, Natty, if we may. Uh, so I realize I'm running a bit over time, so I'm going to speed this along here a bit. Just to show the next village down from ourselves, this is Jose Rente. Started a year ago, the man has been working all his life on the land. The river's been here. And Sheila will talk a little bit about this, about the personal. The you see, it's the same situation all over the world. No planning, no coordination for the government, no coordination or agreement. There's nothing moving to, to help us from the administration side. There's going to be no more water because there's a drought all the way around the area. There's no possibility of getting water from other supplies outside the province. And desalinated water, there's not a chance. There's not 57 million euros. And industrial agriculture cannot afford 60,000 euros a day for 60,000 tons. So the current drought is causing problems. Determination of damage. Okay, it's emblematic. We're left with seriously depleted, which basically we're, we're on the edge of, of destruction. Yes, uh, give us a quick, uh, a quick go there. This is just 800 meters from the source of the river. This is within the protected zone. I took pictures of this, and then we got lawyers on the case, and they stopped this within three days. You can see it is complete devastation of a protected zone. Environmental damage, well, you've seen that. It's basically an ecocide. Without water, there's no social or economic development. We're looking towards the complete draining of the aquifer within a year or two years and, and a total catastrophe. Economic financial losses, okay. There's going to be financial losses to the gross domestic pro uh, 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 product of Almeria, either with stopping six million olive trees or letting them go on, because when the water runs out, the money runs out. 
uh, who is responsible, the Junta de Andalusia, they've known about this since 1998. Recommendations. Andalusia, the Junta de Andalusia, to take action. The, the, the Ombudsman could stop this. Um, no solutions coming. The administration can declare legally overexploited, and then we start to notch into existing law. The administration prefers to say malestado because that is not, that doesn't bring in action in local law. Right? Uh, I'd recommend the media be able to declare this is the last olive harvest for one more year of six million olive trees. Our area will be in a critical and disastrous situation. Um, recommend actions. Uh, like a class action by the families and, uh, and, and uh, uh, who've lost their livelihoods and have lost the value of their properties, a class action against the administration. Uh, finally, water is life, rainfall is minimal, there's no extra reserves, there's no plan in place, the continuing 422% over-exploitation will precipitate an irreversible ecocide. And finally, this is a piece of graffiti put on by a friend of mine on the wall, and it really does say it. The Ultima, Agu Ultima Aguas is the water turning into money and dissolving into skeletons. Thank you very much. I'm an ecologist and I'm also a founder of an environmental NGO called New Environmentalist. And, uh, I've been living uh, in, in southern Spain, I was a neighbor of David for a number of years and uh, um, we did a report back in 2016 on the situation of the river. Could you, could you tell us uh, about the report? Yes. Uh, if you can tell us the methodology you use and also how long have you been in, investigate, researching about the, the Awe and the area? Yeah, the research took about a year and a half, um, and I prepared a, a presentation. It, it, it was quite a large report that analyzed everything, uh, the, the status of the river, the, uh, the, the natural habitats encountered there, the fauna and the flora of the river, and we made some recommendation, and then we looked at Natural 2000 and how the legislation of, is or is not applied in that context. And I made a, a presentation that is basically a summary of that report. Yeah. It's quite long, but then I, I try to, to stick only to uh, a few habitats and a few of the species impacted by, um, by the loss of water, basically. Okay. Okay? Okay. So, yeah, um, my presentation will be, uh, it's called Accelerating Extinctions, the Effect of Water Loss on Insular Habitats and Species. Um, it's based on the report from 2016. Um, you can see the river there, the bottom still flowing strongly. Um, why is it an insular habitat? As David mentioned, it's an oasis and basically it's very rare to have in a, in a semi-arid environment like um, it's a pre-desert environment like it is in the south of Spain and Almeria. It's very rare to actually have um, a, an oasis of, of, uh, of green which is provided by the river. And that uh, for us was the oasis effect and that's why this insular habitat uh, effect applies. And in our case, it having the humidity from the water allows for the presence of many habitats and species that are dependent on water. So if the river dries up, then, then um, basically we're looking at extinction. Example of how insular uh, biogeography applies, you see the surrounding uh, natural dryness of, of southern Spain, and you see the oasis effect in the middle provided by the, by the river. A little bit more of the park, uh, Dave, my colleague, already uh, mentioned a lot. Uh, what we were interested in it was the presence of unique habitats and, and system, uh, ecosystem, including 17 protected habitats at European level and numerous um, endemic and rare species that would make this uh, that would make the park a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, other elements as well, gypsum, obviously, that's why the park was designated the uh, Natural 2000 site, is because it's largely composed of gypsum, and it's, uh, it's a very unique uh, habitat. Most plants are, are toxic, uh, gypsum is toxic to most plants, but gypsophyte species, such as the ones we meet here, thrive in this, in this type of soil and are abundant 
in the area. So it's, it's quite a unique habitat. It was designated um, and protected since 1989 under various uh, various levels of protections from um, from a special from a Paraje Natural, which is the Spanish equivalent. But Paraje Natural is a very weak sort of legislation under Spanish uh, law. It doesn't actually confer much much protection. It refers to basically an incorporation of human activity inside a natural area. It's not, it doesn't have the same protection as a natural park or a, or a national park. Um, wildlife corridors and habitat fragmentations. We looked at that as well. We walked the length of the river. And you can see the, an example of a, of a wildlife corridor. The green in the middle by the river, that's a wildlife corridor. And, uh, and habitat fragmentation everywhere around that corridor. The roads and the agriculture around it, that's basically habitat fragmentation. Uh, we walked the river, so we, the study lasted for about a year and a half, in which we looked at uh, most of the river. And although in official documents the river is is, uh, is stated as permanently with a permanent water flow throughout the year, what we noticed in our walks that um, it it's it's no longer permanent. It, there is no water for about half of the half of the previous uh, flow of the river. And we took some pictures along the river. You can see. At the top, where the water still flows, next to David's village, uh, Los Molinos, but in the middle, in the middle of, uh, of, the, of the course, it no longer flows. It's just basically uh, back to pre-desert desert environment. And since we started um, analyzing this, it's been getting worse. You can see how it looked like in November 2015, under a bridge in, next to the town of Ture, and how it looked at the beginning of this month. There is no more water left there. Even though this year has been a particularly good year, they had a decent amount of rain. But the water is being sucked up through the natural system, and the, but the river still doesn't, doesn't flow naturally anymore. Conservation status of the river, there's a lot of issues in there, because it's not just a lack of water, it's also environmental pollution, it's, it's fragmentation, and it's in both natural sites. It's one site called Paraje Natural Castin Yeso, and then there's another one called Sierra Cabrera Bendar, and both sites are in, are in a bad uh, state, both in terms of uh, water pollution and in terms of um, uh, the quantity of water. And you can see the reason why. Uh, there's what used to be a pre-desert environment, now from, from a drone it looks like a, a, a some sort of a man-made anthropogenic creation. It looks like it's full of life, but it's it's uh, artificially irrigated, and that's where most of the aquifer that has been uh, that's more, most of the water from the underground goes in inside these massive plantations. And despite having an issue with water exploitation, there's been no uh, no measurements from the authorities of the of the river levels, no controls of boreholes extractions, no monitoring of water flow or no limitation on the rights of uh, industrial owners to uh, on the amount of water that they can extract. So habitats, we looked at uh, how habitats are being affected by, um, by uh, the lack of water. And you can see a picture there at the top how, um, how, how, the, how it looks like now with water flowing and at the bottom where, how it looks like where the water has stopped flowing. That was maybe 50 years ago, but within Within 20, 10, 20, 30 years, nothing is left of the, of the original vegetation. There's a blank slide there. Um, we looked at the habitats present, and there were like 17 out of the 17 habitats present in the park on the Natura 2000. Not one of them was in a favorable condition. All of them were either unknown or, or in a bad, bad condition under European legislation. Some of the examples of, the, I'm not going to go through all of the habitats there, but I've given some examples. There are, there are very unique habitats, like these petrifying springs with tufa formations. They're water habitats, hard water mixed with mosses and other animals, aquatic animals that live there. And they're quite rare at European level. They're only dependent, they depend on hard water, and obviously if, if the river dries up, this habitat disappears as well. And it's, it's a micro habitat, it only occurs in one hectare, so it's something very small and very easy to protect if you are if you have the intention of protecting it. There's gypsum habitats like the Iberian gypsum vegetation. This is connected to gypsum plants. That's a very unique sort of habitat that that plants and animals that only grow on gypsum soils. 
this is quite rare as well, and it's been impacted by the lack of lack of water and by intensive agriculture and by mining. There are mines everywhere. There's at least seven mines that surround the parks where they where they're mining for gypsum, basically, and it goes to all over the world. Most of it to South Africa and other big uh, users of gypsum. <coughs> There's other smaller habitats. This, this is basically uh, small shrubs, pre-desert shrubs, and they're affected as well. There's only 49 natural uh, 2,000 sites in Europe that have this type of habitat, and Spain is the one with the most abundant. So it's quite a rare habitat at European level. Vulnerable species, we looked at uh, different species uh, in the park. The park is unique because it's on a migration route. There's a lot of migratory birds, and it's the last stop before they fly into Africa. So it's, it's, it's quite a hot spot for birds. One study from 2003 found on a small three, three kilometer area, they found over 78 species of birds that either migrate there or they, uh, they're permanent residents of the park. So it's, it's quite unique in terms of birds. And Spain as a whole, it's, it's, a, it's a hot spot for Europe. It has over 85,000 species of animals, but a lot of them are in danger or at, at risk because of environmental legislation not being applied, especially in southern Spain. We looked at uh, unique species like this uh, Mediterranean turtle, it's an aquatic species. So obviously it's, it's dependent on the river, it's considered vulnerable at, uh, at regional level, but there's a lot of them in, in, uh, on the river. Like you can see it in the bottom picture there, in some areas you can find up to 30 or 40 different turtles on one rock. Unfortunately this is not necessarily a good thing because what we found in our study is that these turtles are retreating from areas of the river, of the riverbed where there's no more water into into smaller pools, and they're overcrowded in in places. And um, basically, they're trapped there. For these animals, is more or less a prison. These last remaining uh, water pools are are a prison to them. And these if these uh, small pools also disappear, then this species disappears from the park as well. We looked at other species like uh, the Spurtai tortoise. This is an emblematic species for Europe as a whole because it's quite rare in the uh, Testuga greca. And it's considered vulnerable in Europe and it's in danger of extinction in, uh, in um, Andalusia. There's a lot of these turtles in the, past, in, in the park. Um, we found that they're also closely connected to water. This, because it's a land tortoise, it's, it was previously considered to be more of a desert adapted species. But in our case, because the park, the park is so hot during summer, it goes over 45 degrees uh, temperature, they go down to the riverbed for water and they also lay their eggs in the riverbed as well. Because it provides them with a bit of protection, the temperature is a bit lower by the river. So it's, uh, it's an extremely important habitat for this, uh, for this species. We found a lot of species that were not included in the report. There was about 26 species that were not included in the management of the park. We found a lot of threats in terms of intensive agriculture with red, non-intensive agriculture with green and mining. You can see the, the blue areas are all, where all the mines are based around the park. Um, climate change. We also looked at the effects of, the possible effects of climate change on this. And this, it's a bit of a laboratory what's happening in, in, uh, in southern Spain because if this river goes, it will basically amplify the, the effects of climate change, which is already for, for Spain, uh, as a location, it will be one of the worst hit by uh, one of the worst hit area by climate change because of its location next to the Sahara, Sahara Desert. Now, if you remove the availability of flowing water from this environment, then it will make it, uh, you you basically amplify the effects of, of climate change. So, it will accelerate extinction rates, and anything that no longer has water in that type of environment, it will you will not have a place to, to go. We produced some recommendations and some conclusions, a lot of conclusions I've included it in my presentation. But yeah, basically, there is glimmer of hope. If water extraction is, uh, is um, it's lowered and if uh, it's monitored, then it's possible to st stabilize this uh, ecocide before it finishes. So. And here is where the European Union should, should go in, because it has introduced some strong environmental legislation, but it's not being applied in the area. And in, in this case, actually, the European Union was a negative factor because it paid for infrastructure, for roads, for, um, 
for the olive plantations, sometimes through agricultural subsidies. So it's kind of working against its own European environmental standards. So yeah, uh, that's how it looks now. This is how it could look in the future. We're trying to basically prevent that from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Carla, do you have any question? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, thank you for a very informative presentation. Um, could you tell us what would happen if the pumping of the water out of the aquifer was stopped? In other words, if it were possible to, to stop the, or at least dramatically reduce the amount of water being abstracted by boreholes, what would the effect of that be? Well, it will take a very long time for the aquifer to replenish because you need to think that this is fossil water. I mean, the, the, the water, the underground water still present in those aquifers, it's water that accumulated over millions of years. So if you reduce it by something like 320%, then you will have you will have the same sort of amount of water that goes in through natural precipitation will equal the amount of water that's taken out through industrial use. But you will have to massively reduce the, the intensive uh, plantations. But even if, would the river start flowing again or does it have to, we have to wait a thousand years for it to be planted? You will have to wait a long time for it to come back uh, to, to its natural flow. But it also depends on weather patterns. If if precipitation increases, it's not predicted to, but it, there is a chance that uh, it, it will, at least if you, if you stop the over-exploitation, it will stabilize it at, at the current level, and it's, it will be sufficient for the, the, these habitats and species to survive. Bueno, eh, primero gracias por darnos la oportunidad de hablar aquí y gracias a todos los ponentes porque realmente, bueno, es una mezcla de tristeza, y esperanza, admiración. Pero gracias a todos los que defienden sus derechos, sus culturas y a la madre tierra. Y ahora, pues yo viví en Barcelona hasta hace unos años, hasta que decidí que esa vida no tenía mucho sentido para mí. Y fui a vivir a esta aldea repoblada de donde viene Té, los molinos del río Aguas. Es un lugar muy peculiar, como habéis visto, es un pequeño oasis eh, donde convive todo tipo de gente, es muy heterogéneo, que intentamos tener una vida pues eso, con un contacto más real con la madre tierra y, y con un respeto mayor. Y allí pues... De repente mi, mi relación, mi vínculo con el agua cambió totalmente porque hasta entonces yo simplemente abría un grifo y como por arte de magia ¿no? salía agua, no sabes muy bien de dónde, parece que es infinita y estando allí en los molinos pues la situación es muy diferente porque el entorno es totalmente árido alrededor, allí el agua es un bien muy preciado Allí el agua con la que regamos las huertas o con la que nos lavamos es la del río que conocemos diariamente, en el que me baño todos los días, el que acaricia mi piel, veo las tortugas, veo todo lo que crea, ¿no? Y realmente yo no esperaba que eso tuviera un impacto tan fuerte en mí, pero así fue. ¿Puedes, ¿puedes explicarnos un poquito más...? ¿Lo que sientes cuando dices que tienes vínculo con el agua? Siento que es algo más real, como te contaba, que cuando veo ese río secarse me duele dentro, es algo profundo, es algo... es como si me atacaran directamente a mí, o sea, yo pensar que algún día dentro tal vez de cinco años llego allí y me encuentro un desierto, es que me rompe el alma. No... no sé... Es, es, es algo mucho más profundo que la relación que había tenido hasta ese momento, ¿no? Como te digo, que era simplemente comercial, factura, agua, pago, vale, tengo agua. No, ahí el descenso que vivimos, allí realmente vemos descender el agua, como habéis visto en las fotos, en dos años es muy claro el descenso y tú vas viendo pues, cómo las tortugas se mueven, como decía yo, solo a una zona. 
lo, lo puedes ver diariamente el efecto que eso tendrá y también ves la vida que trae ese agua y cómo toda esa vida va a desaparecer no solo a la humana por supuesto. ¿podríamos afirmar que tú, Sheila y la comunidad son víctimas de lo que le está pasando al agua? Y yo creo que, que sí, claro o sea, cualquier bueno, en mi caso por ejemplo yo ahora hace un mes que ya no vivo en este lugar me he desplazado a las montañas eh, también en el sur de España porque no veía un futuro allí, porque ya hace, pues el verano pasado no pude regar mi huerta, porque los niveles de la acequia, que las acequias son de tiempos árabes, o sea, esa, esa acequia ha traído agua desde tiempos de los árabes, o incluso los romanos, pues el año pasado no teníamos nivel suficiente de agua en la acequia como para regar nuestras huertas, con lo cual este año decidí ya no plantar porque era totalmente, no era factible, y la vida cada vez es más difícil, también eh, allí vivimos, una, yo en cinco años he vivido como una situación en la que o no llueve, o sea, en la que hay años de sequía, o cuando llueve lo hace de forma totalmente torrencial y destructiva. Entonces cuando llueve, como pasó en, en este diciembre pasado, nuestra acequia se anega de barro, rocas, árboles, los muros caen y tenemos que trabajar, pues en este invierno estuvimos un año y medio, eh, digo un mes y medio, eh, diariamente sacando toneladas de barro todos los vecinos para conseguir traer otra vez agua ¿no? a nuestro pueblo entonces cada vez las condiciones se hacen más difíciles y en mi caso he decidido desplazarme pero yo aún no tengo bueno, soy joven, no tengo familia me ha sido relativamente fácil, aunque emocionalmente no pero hay muchísima gente vinculada a esa tierra que no puede hacer lo mismo. Hay mucha gente a la que se está condenando con, este, con esta gestión suicida del agua que se está haciendo en Almería. ¿Tú, ¿Tú podrías afirmar que el río de aguas también es víctima? Por supuesto, sí, sí, sí. Pues, bueno, como te comentaba, nosotros diariamente vemos el descenso y si sí, yo en cinco años he visto claramente descender, o sea, de zonas que estaban en las que incluso podíamos nadar y ahora están totalmente secas, es claramente una víctima, está, está muriendo, es que está moribundo. Y no es solo el río de aguas, o sea, es que la gestión del agua es, es la zona más salida de Europa, con lo cual el agua es un bien aún más preciado que en el resto de España, que ya la situación en España en general es muy difícil con el agua. Y en lugar de tener esto en cuenta y tratarlo con el máximo respeto y no, se actúa como si, pues, no sé, es que las imágenes hablan por sí solas, esos, esos olivos, se, planta, se dio permiso para plantar esos olivos, eh, incluso cuando la misma administración había dicho que este río estaba en muy mal estado y que no podía soportar más sobreexplotación y a pesar de eso se dio permiso para plantar esos millones de olivos que hemos visto en las imágenes. Entonces, no sé a qué están abocando a las gentes de, de esa tierra y al ecosistema, por supuesto. Si ¿Sí lo podrías contarnos si es que la comunidad se ha organizado para proteger el río y qué, qué dificultades han tenido. Eh, hace como unos tres años, la primera alarma la dieron bueno, los vecinos de Los Molinos porque por la situación de nuestro pueblo, al estar también desconectados de la, de la red de agua, y ser por tanto testigos directos, o sea, estamos solo a un kilómetro del nacimiento del río donde surge ¿no? al exterior, viene el subterráneo durante unos 30 kilómetros y, y surge cerca de nuestra aldea, entonces nosotros somos testigos privilegiados de, de ese descenso. Eh, y entonces, bueno, fuimos un poco los primeros en darnos cuenta, además un profesor de la universidad que llevaba años estudiando esta zona que también dio la voz de alarma porque él tomaba mediciones y vio que habíamos pasado de tener como unos 45 litros por segundo, incluso 60, a 4 o 5 litros por segundo emanando actualmente. Entonces decidimos organizarnos y creamos una plataforma ciudadana, la plataforma en defensa del río Aguas. Eh, y durante estos tres años principalmente al principio hemos hecho más una labor didáctica porque nos encontramos con que los pueblos de alrededor de la zona, aun dependiendo también del acuífero, están conectados con la red y no había como una sensibilización o un, 
no hay como un espíritu de lucha en general en esa zona. Es una zona muy deprimida y desde siempre se ha vendido como que este tipo de agricultura es riqueza, es economía y, y ha calado bastante este mensaje. Entonces, en primer lugar, pues hicimos mucho como labor didáctica de decir, bueno, es que esto a qué tipo de futuro nos aboca, ¿no? Y, y hablar también con con agricultores tradicionales, de cómo estaban sus pozos, realmente todos han notado descenso, pero también se dice que es por la sequía, simplemente no se habla tanto de la gestión. Entonces, bueno, durante mucho tiempo hemos hecho eso, sobre todo labor didáctica. Eh, hace un año aproximadamente empezó a cambiar la conciencia, poco a poco, porque lleva todo muy lento, cuando los alcaldes de estos pueblos reconocieron públicamente que sus pozos estaban secando, que no iba a haber agua para las poblaciones. Entonces ya, claro, ya no es lo mismo que, que unos colgados de un pueblecito, ¿no? Que, que lo dicen, ya son como sus alcaldes que están diciendo sí, los pozos jamás habían estado tan bajos, muchos hemos tenido que cerrarlos y, y el futuro está negro. Entonces ahora sí que vemos más una reacción, pero es lento. Esto nos ha ayudado hace poco, pues como decía Dave, el sábado hubo una manifestación en Almería y hubo cientos de personas y eso para ser Almería es bastante, reclamando pues, que no se robe su agua, ¿no? Pero bueno... Si, la, si es que este tribunal tuviera una varita mágica para cambiar las cosas en Almería, ¿qué le pedirías? Pues bueno, que paralicen ese sinsentido que, que hable con quien que tenga que hablar, que nos ayuden legalmente también, porque nos dicen que no tenemos derechos a no estar conectados a la red, no hay derechos históricos, eh, aunque sea una acequia que viene. De... Entonces, pues legalmente sí pueden ayudarnos, también, eh, con, no sé, contactos, dar a conocer el, el caso, porque creo que, que es un caso bastante llamativo y que está en Europa, en el, es en la huerta de Europa y que lo conoce muy poca gente. Creo que realmente la gente se sensibilizaría con este tema si, si fuera más conocido. Y redes, no sé yo, a veces no, viendo que el, todos los rincones del mundo están un poco así, pues la verdad que pierdo un poco la esperanza, pero si me queda alguna es en crear redes y nosotros un poco con esta visión, ahora hace unos meses nos unimos con todas las problemáticas de Almería relacionadas con el agua, porque esta no es la única, o sea, hay... En otro lugar de Almería están plantando lechugas también a un nivel parecido y también se están quedando sin agua. Entonces hemos hecho una unión, se llama Acuíferos Vivos y luchamos por el agua en general en Almería. Y mi visión siempre ha sido que esto llegue a Andalucía, a España y al mundo. Porque al final a veces los problemas locales es como David contra Goliat, pero si nos unimos todos pues cogemos fuerza. ¿no? Entonces también si ellos de alguna forma pueden ayudarnos a a extender estas redes y a hacernos más fuertes todos los que defensores del agua y de los derechos de la naturaleza de las personas pues ya sería un gran paso muchas gracias Sila sí,